If you're joining us for the first time this morning, we are uh, three weeks into, or the third week into, a season of fasting and prayer, and people are fasting in different ways. It's not too late to join in. Uh, if you go to our website, gtmoncton.com, I have information there on just exactly what fasting is and how you can grow in that, how you can participate many different ways. But uh, we are moving to our third week, and you may recall for those who are part of the church that on the first Sunday of the month on January 7th, <clears throat> we spoke about fasting, and, and one of the purposes for fasting is the Lord wants to use that to cleanse our spirits. It's during a time of fasting as we focus on our spirit, our walk with the Lord, that the Lord just has a beautiful way of cleansing, we say, our spiritual palate. Uh, in fact, it's been interesting as I've talked to many different people during this time of fasting, one of the common uh, testimonies is I'm just feeling cleaner. I'm just feeling like God is just cleansing me. And I'm just inquire, acquiring those new appetites. And so oftentimes as we just live and work in this world and try our best to serve the Lord, we find ourselves taking on different cravings, appetites, values of our culture that really rob us of what it means to be spirit-filled people. Uh, last week we talked about how important it is as we move into 2024 that we have a strategy for spiritual growth. Uh, it's a good thing to have goals. It's a good thing to have a sense of direction, what we feel to give ourselves, our time, our energy to. But the simple question is, as believers, is in setting those goals, um, have I asked the Lord about it? Are they just goals that I have set, things that seem to be practical, common sense? Or have I consulted the Lord who knows what tomorrow holds? Have I asked him, Lord, what do you want to give myself to? What do you want me to focus on? How do I spend my money? How do I spend my time, my relationships? And we ask the simple question as well, when was the last time God did something in your life that actually changed the way that you live? And so that's the reality of the kind of relationship the Lord wants to have with us. This morning, I want to talk about that as well or continue along that vein a little bit. <clears throat> and I want to speak about living by God's power. And I want to ask the question, when was the last time not only God did something in your life that changed the way that you lived, when was the last time God did something through your life that actually changed the way somebody else lived, that actually impacted somebody else's life? So I want to talk about living by God's power in our scriptures, 1 Corinthians 4.20. It's a very simple, very brief scripture, but why don't you read it with me? The kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. Would you say that again? The kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. I believe all in my heart that God is doing a wonderful work in his people around the world. There are phenomenal things that God is doing around the world, and we're seeing some new things God is doing even in our own nation. But you know, God is not only doing new things. Because God is God, because he is sovereign, God is also doing the next thing in what he is sovereignly bringing together in the world. God has a plan for our world. In fact, he has such a precise plan that he actually went out on a limb and thousands of years ago through the prophets and through the apostles, he revealed various things that are going to be happening in the world, especially at the end of time as the world comes to the conclusion and we see the literal reign of Christ upon the earth and all those beautiful things of, of what the Lord wants to restore. And so the Lord has a plan and there are many sovereign things that are going on in the world. And it can seem like a lot of things are happening where you wonder sometimes, I mean, is God really in control? And one of the reasons we think that way is because we, we kind of have this mindset, well, if God is really in control, then my life is going to be really easy. If God is really in control, I'm going to retire at 55, I'm going to have a nice pension, I'm going to have a house on the lake, everybody's going to love me, I'm going to die at 95 in my sleep. If God is really in control. But I'm just kind of naive enough to believe that if God is really in control, he's after the main thing. And the main thing is why he sent his son, Jesus, into the world. God is after saving people who are lost in sin. And sometimes he has to let the world go crazy. He has to let things fall apart that we've come to trust in and our humanists to realize that is not the answer that will not fulfill. We need something more, and we realize that that more that we need is Jesus. It's a relationship with God. I, I believe God is much more concerned about that than just our comfort for this brief period of time that we call life. God is in this for eternity. He's come to redeem a people. And so who knows what lies ahead, but in the midst of whatever is going on, we know that God is preparing his people. Now, part of that preparation and preparing his people is that we, God's people, have to make a fundamental decision. And that is whether or not we are actually going to be the people of God. Does that make sense? We have to make a decision, the preparation, if we are going to be the people of God. 
If we're going to be people who actually don't just believe certain things, but we are a people who actually understand what we have in Jesus Christ. Are we actually going to be a people who live in what we profess to believe? We operate in those things. Are we going to be a people who offer to others what it is that we have to give? The kingdom is not in word, but in power. It is not just religious talk. We know that very well. Then what is it? Living in the kingdom is actually living in the abilities that Jesus has made available to us in sending us the Holy Spirit, Acts 1 and 8, the promise that he made. Now, Paul is not denying the sheer force of God's word, but he wants us to understand that just as the gospel of Jesus Christ came to you not only in word, but also came to you in power enough to change your life, that the word that is now yours to share has the same power to affect change in lives that you get to share it with that you get to minister to. You see, the evidence of a living faith is a living flow of the life of Jesus through you. That's what a living faith really is. That's what Jesus saved us for. That's what Jesus invites us into as his people. He didn't say, listen, I'm just inviting you to agree with me, and this is the good news, and this is what you need, and so make sure you, you, know, you line up with me. Jesus says, listen, it's by that revelation that you come to know me, but that's just the entrance. That's just the door to a whole new way of life that I've made you for. In fact, Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, he said, for our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit. Now, that phrase, in power, literally means together with. He says, the word came to you together with the Spirit of God. Now, the word of God, the Bible, is foundational to our Christian lives. The word of God is a revelation of just ultimate reality, of what really life is all about, the matters that are truly important. But having said that, without the Spirit of God in our lives, along with the word of God, the word of God is dead in the water. The Word of God is of no effect. I was sharing earlier this morning, sharing with some friends, as I've been reading through the book of Romans, I'm reminded that Paul is talking about the law of God. See, all Scripture is of God. God breathed. All Scripture, New Testament, Old Testament, it's all anointed of God. It's all powerful. But the Apostle Paul was saying to the believers in the book of Romans, saying, listen, if you just embrace the Word, but you don't have the Spirit, If you think that just by following the rules, it's enough, he said, you're missing it. It's not alive. You've got to have the Word and the Spirit. If you don't have the Spirit, then the Word is only law. It doesn't matter if it's Old Testament or New Testament. It doesn't matter. That's all it is. It's just a good book that shows you the way that you should live. But if that's all we have, Paul says, then you're always going to have the same frustration of me, he said in Romans 7. He said, I have the desire to do what it says, to do what is good, but I don't have the power to carry it out. And so we can have the word as Christians. We can know what it is we should do. We can, we can read the promises of God. But if we don't have the Spirit of God, the power of God, to quicken that Word and to make it alive, we may agree with it, but we'll always think in our minds, that's for somebody else. God doesn't do that kind of stuff through people like me. And yet we are people in whom His Spirit dwells. So when Paul says the kingdom of God is not in word but in power, he's saying that this life that we live in Jesus, it's not just a matter of talk. It is the Word of God together with the power of God. Another translation says the kingdom of God is present, not in talk, but in power. Will you say that with me? The kingdom of God is present, not in talk, but in power. I wanted to open my message up with a little video clip from a pastor in, uh, in Nashville. Her name is Alex Seeley. She's co-pastor with her husband, a wonderful church I forget the name of it, but a wonderful church. And I can't explain it like she did. And I went to dig it up, and it was gone. It was on Instagram. doesn't last a long time. Couldn't find it. But in in, in, in essence, what she was saying is this. She was speaking to leaders and church leaders and ministers. She's saying, listen, she says, we live in this age of influence, whether through social media, whether through all the tech that we have, all the technology, all that we can do, we so rely on, on influence, we so rely on style, we so rely on so many of these surface things. But she said, 
don't you ever confuse influence with authority. There's a world of difference. You see, we can be slick. We can be fancy. We can say all the right things. We can speak with enticing words like Paul said. But if you don't have a demonstration of God's spirit and power, then all that word is is an expectation that you can't fulfill. All that word is is a revelation to somebody else of their need and yet no power to change. You see, people are, a God is not interested, I don't believe, in simply people coming to Christ and praying a little sinner's prayer. That you somehow have a debate with somebody about Jesus and convince them, well, I guess he's right. That's a good place to start. But if that individual does not have a revelation of the Spirit of God, a work of the Spirit in their heart where they encounter Jesus, most times it's not going to stick. Because it's not just in word, it is the word that convicts, it's the Spirit of God who comes and empowers you to live in this new life that He offers you. He doesn't ask you to live it in your own strength. The word with the Spirit. Another, he says the kingdom of God is present, not in talk, but in power. And as I'm reading that scripture this week, I just thought, Lord, let that be just my life. Lord, I don't want your kingdom just to be how eloquently I can speak. Lord, I want your kingdom to be present. I want it to be here. I want it to be wherever I am, that I know that there's a dependence in my heart upon you, that when I step out to minister, when I step out to just follow your direction, Lord, I can sense that your anointing is there. I can sense this confidence, Lord, that you are going to do something. You're going to leave that person changed. It may not be in a radical way. It may be, but it may just be simply that person having sensed the touch of God on their life. Through something you said, something you did, there's, there's something more about you than just being a nice person. There's something upon your life that we know is the Spirit of God. God wants to prove to you and me that what we believe is not a lie, but it is alive. And he's looking for people who care enough that he can actually demonstrate that through you. What exactly is this power? In the Greek language, the word power is dunamis. We kind of get our word dynamite from that. Dunamis just has that ability to dislodge things that have been locked in place for so long. But the word dunamis means ability, strength, miracle, or virtue. And so what this dunamis is, is that it's actually power enough to do the miraculous, to do things through you that you cannot humanly do in your own strength. So it does perform the miraculous, but just as importantly, it is also a moral power. There is just as much power required to raise the dead, you might say, as there is for you and me to live a pure life in a perverted society. And the Holy Spirit wants to give you that power. In fact, he wants to work that purity in you. Why? Because sin is what robs you of authority. Purity is what makes you realize that that authority was within you, and you can begin to step out in confidence to what God wants you to do. Don't bother raising your hands, but how many of you at one time or another have found yourself in a situation where you just feel like the Lord has opened the door to minister? Somebody at work is going through something, you get a chance to share, or maybe somebody's interested in hearing about the gospel, you get a chance to share. Maybe someone is sick and you're saying, oh, I'd just love to reach out and pray for them, whatever it may be. But when you go to do that, you have this hindering thought that says, but I can't do that because of what I did this week. I can't do that because, man, I really messed up in this area of purity, whatever it may be, right? Why? Because even though the Lord can still use you, we just kind of feel ourselves, we shut ourselves down. Why? Because we just know we've not been pure. It robs that authority. Whereas when we walk in purity in the midst of a perverse society, the Lord gives us that sense of authority. Now, Dr. John Medina is a molecular biologist. He's also a researcher in the genetics of uh, psychiatric disorders. And uh, he writes about many things, just many wonders of the human body. And I'll just give you a couple of them that really fascinated me. One, he says, he says, you take the human heart. Most people don't realize this, but in the average lifespan of a person, your heart will beat 2.5 billion times. Two and a half billion times. Now, during your lifetime, your your heart will actually pump enough blood that it will fill 13 super tankers. Isn't that amazing? 13 oil super tankers. That's how hard, how incredible your heart is. He talked about the efficiency of your body's metabolism. 
Some of our bodies are more efficient than others. But he says that if you ride a bike for an hour at 10 miles an hour, your body will use the amount of energy contained in only three ounces of carbohydrates. Now, I wish it was the other way around. I wish it required like 10 pounds of carbohydrates because we'd all just be, you know, super thin. But that's how incredibly efficient the, the uh, metabolism is in our body. They say that that would be similar to your car getting about 1,500 kilometers to a gallon. That's how amazing your, your body is. And then he talks about the miracle of our DNA. It's estimated that the average female is made up of 26 trillion cells. Imagine, 26 trillion cells. The average man is made up of 36 trillion cells. As I said in first service, that explains the love handles. That's where the 10,000 or the 10 trillion, we have a lot more to work off than you do. But in those cells, there is what is called a nucleus. And inside that nucleus are our chromosomes. We have 23 pair or 46 chromosomes. Those chromosomes, you might say, are a package for our DNA. Our DNA, as many of us are familiar with, carry the, the uh, information for our cells and our bodies to grow and for our cells to multiply. Now, Dr. Medina goes on to say that into each cell nucleus is folded six and a half feet of DNA. If you take the chromosome and you just were able to untangle it, it would be six and a half feet long. Pretty amazing. He says, it's the equivalent of you taking 30 miles of fishing line and fitting it inside the pit of a cherry. That's how miraculous that is. Inside a cherry pit. And you don't just squish it in. It's actually folded. In fact, they tell us that if you fold your DNA a certain way, then your cell is going to be a skin cell. If you fold your DNA another way, it's going to be a liver cell or some other part of your body. That's how intricate it is. In fact, we're also told that your body contains enough DNA in those trillions of cell nuclei that if you were to take all of your DNA in your body and unravel it and connect it end to end in a line, it's actually long enough to circle the sun 260 times. That's all inside of you. David said in Psalm 139, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. The thought that God put into you, the little things we don't even think of, something as simple as our taste buds. Do you realize that God could have created this world and made everything gray, no color? God could have created our food and just as a, as a function, we knew we have to put this stuff in our body to keep, the, to keep the body going. But instead, he creates all these different flavors and colors that we are able to enjoy. So God performs this miracle in our human body. And yet, as remarkable as the human body is, my friends, it does not even begin to compare to the amazing abilities that God has folded into the spirit of a person who's been born again. Into the person in whom Jesus lives by his Holy Spirit. What he has folded into us, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, we know it well. When somebody becomes a Christian, they become what? A brand new person inside. They're not the same anymore. A new life has been begun. I think one of the reasons why we hear so much over this last decade teachings on our identity is because for so many of us, at least in the Western church, we really don't realize what Jesus Christ has done in our life when he saved us. When we were born again, when our spirits came alive, that we really are a brand new person. Unfortunately, many of us, and primarily because many in the Western church are never in the Word of God, they never give out an opportunity to speak truth in their spirit, to reveal things to them, to reveal things pertaining to their identity. Because of that, we take our cues from the enemy, who tells us what we aren't, who tells us what will never change, who reminds us of what has been in the past, and therefore that defines our future. And we don't hear the word of the Lord that comes to us and says, if you are in me, you're not that person anymore. 
Whatever your experience, whatever anybody has told you, whatever your natural mind thinks or limits you to or shuts you down, listen to me, the Lord says, this is my word to you. You are a brand new person because I live inside of you. And if you'll begin to allow me to live my life through you, to crowd out what is not of you, what should not be there, to really begin to change. That's why the scripture says we need to renew our mind. There's so much that has to do with regeneration and renewal that all has to do with what? With bringing us into our identity of what it means to be a son and daughter of God. That we are called to be a people who actually live by the power of God. We are called to be a people who understand that we have been born again, that the life of Jesus may not only come to us, but we are to minister Jesus through us. We are to expect a different dimension of life. We are to understand a different dimension of reality. We are to see things differently. We are to believe for things differently. We are to go into situations that everybody in their human abilities have written off, but we walk and we say, no, 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 you don't understand. This can be different. This can be redeemed. This can be healed. It might seem impossible to you, but God has a plan for you. God has a purpose for you. He has not destined you to this. He has destined you to know him, to be saved, to be set free, to be filled with his life, and to live in a different way than you've ever lived before, and to expect different things in your life. John writes of Jesus in John 1, out of what? His fullness, not more religion, not more laws, not more rules and regulations, but simply out of him. Isn't that beautiful? Jesus doesn't come to give us a new religion. He comes to give us himself. And out of that fullness of himself, we begin to experience and live in the joy and the freedom that he's intended for us. Out of his fullness, we have all received grace in place of grace that we've already received. The Lord will give you enough grace, enough help that you need in order to experience the fullness of what it means to know him. And then when that's used up, he says, don't worry, I got more grace coming for what I've got for you next. And he wants us to not only live in the fullness of what it means to know him, he wants us to operate in the abilities that he has placed within us. He wants to bring us to that next level. And that's my heart as we're still in this season of fasting. Just another challenge I want to put out to you. I want you, as we said last week, you know, to discover again, what is God's word to you? What is something God wants to do in your life that will change the way that you live? But this morning, I want to add to that and ask you, are you allowing the Lord by his spirit to do something in your life, through your life, that actually changes the way people around you live, that changes their destiny, that changes their view on life because they've met Christ through you or through the expression of his, the gifts of his Holy Spirit? Uh, Paul said, as we read last week, the gift of God, the Holy Spirit, lives inside you. Think about that for a moment. The gift of God, His Spirit, lives inside you. Now, if that is true, and I believe it is, my question is, should there not be some things happening in you and through you that only God can do? Should there not be an element of our life where God is working through us, where God just adds a different dimension of, of insight, of wisdom, of, of love, a capacity that's, that's just not there in our human abilities, of the things that Jesus promised his people would do. I was struck by a scripture I read this past week in my quiet time, Colossians. Paul said, for this I toil, struggling with all his energy, that he powerfully works within me inside of me. I said, Lord, I just jotted that down in my journal. I said, let that be true of me. Lord, let that be true of me. You've not called me to struggle in the flesh, but there are things in life where I'm going to struggle. And part of the reason why there is a struggle is because the Lord wants to bring his kingdom forth in that area. And, And Jesus said in Matthew, he said, the kingdom of God allows for violence. It allows for struggle. And it's the violent who take it by force. What does that mean? It's the people of God who understand that God has given us promises. There are real things that God has done in our lives. There are provisions that God has made for us. But listen, saints, it doesn't just drop out of the sky. 
He says, it's there for all who believe, but are you willing to contend for it? Not that you earn it, but it's going to come with a struggle because everything in your flesh, everything in your natural mind, everything of well-meaning friends around you, they're going to tell you, hey, don't get crazy. Don't get radical. Don't be disappointed. Yada, 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 yada. And God is looking for a people who say, listen, in this season, this is God's word to me. And I believe he wants to do it. So I'm going to contend for his word. Jesus says those are the ones who break in. Those are the ones who lay hold. Those are the ones who have a living faith and a living flow of the life of Jesus through them. And he says it's available for all of us. I have two sons, Ben and Alex, 31 and almost 28. And when they were born or in their younger years, you could tell that they were our children, especially if they were bad. Vanessa would say, that's your son. That's your side of the family. But as they grew older, even as young children, you could begin to see expressed in their lives certain personalities, certain mannerisms. Some things reminded you of your family, some things you had no idea where that came from. I can remember Ben when he was in kindergarten, it was the first day of school. And Ben loved little animals playing with dinosaurs and all that kind of stuff. And I'm just standing in line waiting to collect him. And there was one father in front of me. I just happened to be second in line. And a, a news reporter came up and he said to the first father, hey, it's the first day of school, kindergarten. We're doing a little, little story for the news. Would you mind an interview? And the guy said, oh, I'm too shy. So he asked me, would you like to? And I said, where do I sign? And so when the class was over, they set up their cameras in there and their lights and everything else, and they brought Ben in, and they sit Ben beside me. He's like five years old. And this is going to be on the 6 o'clock news. And so they asked me a little bit about school, what it's like for your first child to be in school, first day of school. So I just talked for a moment. Then they turned to Ben, and they said, what was your first day like? And Ben looked at the camera and said, Roar! That's my boy. <laughs> I don't know where that came from. But he loved dinosaurs. But do you think at any point in the life of my sons that I had to set them down and say, okay, son, listen, it's time for you to start getting taller. Or son, it's time for you to start looking a bit like me. Or maybe acting a bit more like your mother. Do I have to do that? Do any of us have to do that? No, why? Because our children have our genes. Our genes are inside of them. They will naturally begin to grow in those things and develop their own personalities, but it begins with those genes that we've placed within them. When Paul says, out of his fullness, we have all received, he's not talking about just a one-time experience. He's talking about an actual spiritual growth that happens in our lives when we lay hold of God's promises all of God's promises. It's something that happens in my life when I actually walk out all of God's provisions. When I see, as the hymn writer said, Jesus has a table spread where all the saints of God are fed, and he invites his chosen people, come and dine. And there are people who are hungry, and they say, Lord, I'm pulling up a chair, and I'm going to feast at your table. There's others who say, no, I'm fine. I already ate somewhere else. I'm good. And the Lord said, that's fine, but that's not going to satisfy I've got a table spread for you. It's all there for you, but it's decide, you have to decide whether or not you want it. Peter said in 1 Peter 4, God has given each of you some special abilities. Each of you have special abilities. Be sure to use them to help each other, passing on to other God's many kinds of blessings. He's saying God has given each of you abilities. At least one, if not more. And those abilities give you the opportunity to pass along to other something of God's blessings. Not just from yourself. There's something supernatural. There's something of God's weight and presence in this. Friends, the Holy Spirit is so confident in who you are as a child of God. He is so committed to your worth and your uniqueness as a human being that he takes great care to fold into your spiritual DNA certain gifts so that through each and every one of us, the life of Jesus can flow. 
I won't take time to turn, but in Romans chapter 12, Paul says that there are many different gifts available to God's people. He says the Holy Spirit will fold your spiritual DNA one way, and you will have the gift to prophesy. You'll have the gift to speak the word of God that God has laid upon your heart to encourage and build up and comfort others. He says the Holy Spirit will fold your DNA another way, and you'll find that you'll have a gift to serve like nobody else. And people recognize this is not just a human ability. There's something about God in this. Or God will fold your DNA another way, and you'll discover that he just made you into the kind of encourager that can just change a person's life, the way they see things, and, and, and just wherever they may be in their lives. There are many, many other gifts as well you can read in 1 Corinthians 12, Romans 12, and so on. But the important thing to understand is this. None of these gifts are just heightened human abilities. That's not what it is. There is a dynamic of the Holy Spirit and his gifting in you that he wants you to understand that you possess. And he gives you the privilege and the opportunity and the joy to actually function in. And it can be many different gifts in many different scenarios. The Holy Spirit grants them to us as we need them and as he needs to flow through us in a given situation. But we need to understand they are all from the Spirit of God so that the life of Jesus can actually impact people in a way that they know that God has touched them. Friends, I believe in the authority of God's word. We need to understand that if Jesus truly lives in you, then there is ministry in you. And there's ministry in you to give. What is ministry? It's not complicated. It just means to take what you have and administer it to a need. If I'm walking down the street and some poor soul drops with a heart attack, if I've had the proper training, what do I do? I take what I know, I administer in that situation and make a difference, maybe save a life. That's what ministry is. And what the Lord is asking of us is that if we will make the decision to say, Lord, I want to be a ministering person. I want to take what you've placed in me. I want to take what it is that I know. I want to take the Spirit of God who lives in me, and I want to administer him to whatever the need may be around us. That's all ministry is. You don't need Bible college training. You don't need a diploma certificate. All you need to do is recognize Jesus lives in you. The Spirit of God lives in you. He is an interceding spirit. He is a ministering spirit. He is a miracle-working spirit, and he lives in you. You know, if there's one thing I've learned in my walk with the Lord over the years, is that the comfort zone is the most uncomfortable place to live as a child of God. And the first step in tapping into the power of God that is in you is simply making the conscious decision that I'm going to change. I'm going to change. I think I've said this before with our Love on Moncton group. We, we get a chance to hit the streets. We're going to be going into malls and cafes and all that kind of stuff and just sharing Christ, praying with people. And I tell the group, I say, listen, guys, I'm, I'm in this group for selfish reasons. I mean, I love to do what we're doing, but I'm just in this group because I need to be accountable. I need to have at least a regular time through the course of the month, three or four times a month, where I know I'm doing nothing else tonight than just going out and talking to people with Jesus. Because I need to do that because it's so easy to hide right here. Even though it's plexiglass. You know, this is my call. This is my ministry. No, 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 no. My ministry is to share Jesus with the lost. My ministry is to go on the highways and the byways and to preach Christ and to see broken lives healed and to penetrate the darkness with light. That's my ministry. Why? Because the Spirit of God lives within me and he yearns to reach the lost. This is my calling. This is the gift the Lord has given me to be a pastor of a church. But that's, there's so much more to being a follower of Jesus Christ. I'm going to ask the worship team to join me, but you know, it's been my experience over the years that most Christians stop really living for Jesus within the first five years of their conversion. I mean really living for Jesus. And then what happens over the next 30, 40, 50 years is they just slowly die spiritually. Do you think that's maybe extreme? Do you think there's any truth in that? It's not God's intention. 
Paul said in Ephesians 2, will you read it with me? God made us to do good works, which he planned in advance for us to live our lives doing. That's what it means to be kingdom people. It means to recognize the Lord has created me, redeemed me, saved me, restored me, to move back into my purpose. And what is my purpose? It's to spend my life doing those things that he's empowered me to do. Things that nobody else can do than those who know the Lord. So I want to encourage us this morning, no matter who you are or what you do, you have the power to change. You have the power, the capabilities to actually be a ministering person. And friends, hear me, nobody can take that from you. Your past can't take it from you. Those around who may accuse you can't take it from you. The only thing that can take it from you is right here between your two ears where you believe the lie and say, I could never do that. God could never use me. I'm not like so-and-so. And Jesus would say, what do you mean you're not like so-and-so? They have the Holy Spirit in them. You have the Holy Spirit in you. That's what qualifies you. There's nothing else. Nothing else. I'll use you in different ways, but I'll touch people through in a way that they know there's something different about you. They know they've been touched by God. I remember praying for a lady a little while ago in a parking lot, and uh, she had an obvious physical ailment there, and she didn't know, uh, I should say, it didn't seem like the Lord healed that. But the moment I began to pray with her, she just began to weep. Why? Because the presence of God just came upon her. The love of God. And I had a chance to share the Lord with her. The Lord can do that through all of us. That's what we're called to be and what we're called to do. Out of his fullness, we have all received. But we have to choose to be a ministering person, right? We have to choose and decide that my living faith is going to be a living flow of the life of Jesus through me. How many would say I'm a candidate for that? Amen. Let it be, Lord. Let it be. It's not complicated. It's not complicated. It's just a matter of believing Jesus lives in me. And Jesus said, the things I've done, greater things will you do. He means in volume. Why? Because it's just one of me. But when there's a thousand people just in Glad Tidings Church, or 1,200 at Hillside, or another thousand among whatever, go on and on, how many believe? Can you imagine through the course of the week, there are literally thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people who carry Jesus into our city. Why isn't our city changed? Because most of us don't believe we can make a difference, <laughs> right? But imagine if we woke up to what it means that Jesus lives in me. And when I wake up even tomorrow, Lord, I choose to be a ministering person. I want my antennae to be up. Whatever you're doing in the marketplace, the workplace, the neighborhood or whatever, Lord, I'm available to you. I'm just going to be obedient and I'll leave the results to you. Just imagine what the Lord will do.